1840, Franz Liszt invented the piano recital. Under his fingers, the piano became both intimate confessional and instrument of theatre, compelling the attentions and emotions of an eager, expectant, and sometimes almost voyeuristic audience. Liszt was the father of several diverse pianistic traditions, but the experience of the public arena was common to all the virtuosi who followed him, whatever their different backgrounds. A large and enthusiastic public celebrated the diversity of virtuosi who followed Liszt, and particularly those who were trained in the conservatoires of Russia and Eastern Europe. Of all these, none was more controversial or inspired greater adulation than Jan Ignaz Paderewski. in 1860, Paderewski didn't study seriously until he was 24. His teacher, Leszczycki, doubted that he would ever make a career as a soloist. Yet despite a flawed technique and a musical taste which sometimes provoked criticism, audiences loved him. After the First World War, he briefly became Prime Minister of Poland, and in his late 70s, he made his debut as a Hollywood movie star. about Paderewski, not myth, the, the fact about Paderewski was an extremely attractive man and who had every woman in the audience gasping with pleasure, not only at his musical and artistic qualities, but also was a very handsome fellow with his shock of waving red hair. Paderewski's pianism was always controversial. Saint-Saëns hailed him as a genius but others criticized him for being sensational, empty, vulgar, and violent. Paderewski was the father of a very, very poor tradition, mm -hmm. exaggerated, he was very affected in it. He was simply a marvelous personality. He was a great 
unforgettably marvelous personality, you know? That would make him a great speaker, make him even a politician, I mean, whatever he chose to be. If Paderewski was the public's favorite concert artist, his fellow pianists would probably have chosen Joseph Hoffmann as theirs. Hoffmann was born in Poland in 1876 and was the most celebrated pupil of the Russian composer-pianist Anton Rubinstein. He made his US debut as a child in New York's Metropolitan Opera House, where his technical control combined with an extraordinary rhythmic and dynamic imagination to produce playing of elemental force and power. He was an incredible pianist. Uh, all the great pianists uh, that I heard during my time considered him the number one. He was the greatest of all of them. Hoffman was really absolutely un unimaginably great. As far as music goes, interpretation and technique. Technically, he had handled everything with it. Not ease, but the, the most natural, most normal approach. And musically, I remember I heard him play, for instance, the Chopin sonata. Uh, the B flat Mars sonata I played the first movement and repeated the exposition. It was superbly played. He repeated it totally differently, but it was just as wonderful. So, musically speaking, he had maybe the greatest knowledge and instinct of all the pianists, and technically, he pocketed, pocketed everybody. Our guest for this performance of the telephone hour is the distinguished pianist Joseph Hoffmann. Suspicious of early recording techniques and engineers, Hoffman toned down the subtleties of his performance when playing in the studio. This was his only filmed appearance. He had everything. He had fantastic technique, beautiful sound. It was hot, cold at the same time. I believe it's from the 40s, this film. I think it's a period where, when he hardly performed anymore, having performed so much in the 20s, for example, and uh, I think he was a heavy drinker by then already. <laughs> and still, it is, I think, quite amazing, especially this Rachmaninoff prelude. Just the complete naturalness with which he plays, as though he would be really one body with the piano. You feel there's absolutely no, no battle with the piano whatsoever. Just this feeling of complete happiness with the instrument, which is absolutely unique, I think.
to Hoffman, it seems everything came without any pain and which at the end became his tragedy. He didn't have anything to hold on to. It's, it's probably destroyed him, this facility. Too much talent sometimes is dangerous. <laughs> Hoffmann was a great admirer of his Russian colleague, Sergei Rachmaninoff, and Rachmaninoff's influence on his contemporaries was prodigious. When he left Russia after the revolution in 1917, Rachmaninoff abandoned his vocation as a composer and became a formidable soloist instead. Joseph Hoffmann described him as having arms of steel and a heart of gold, and the critic Harold Schoenberg wrote of him that so big were his musical thoughts, so aristocratic his instincts, that he ennobled whatever he played. As most of the great pianists, he developed and he had a sound of his own, which was the most interesting, most, most penetrating, most colorful uh, playing. And uh, the way he played the rich study for a melody was absolutely unique. He being a composer, of course, he wrote, he played music as freely as, as he uh, knew that music should be. His technique was formidable, and the polyphony, and the, the bringing out inner voices, the coloring, and the little uh, rubatos, the arpeggios, which were very individual, and certain individual motions, the, the way he produced those sounds, were very, very characteristic of him. And I must say, luckily, he recorded all the concertos. And unluckily, many people don't listen to those. And many people interpret the Rachmaninoff concertos in a rather different way than he suggested how they should be. They usually sentimentalize it. And Rachmaninoff was never sentimental, was very romantic, very emotional, but never in bad taste, never excessive. Maninoff's greatest disciples was Benno Moisevich, who played with similar fiery impassivity. Rachmaninoff was reported to have said that the younger man played his works better than he did. Moisevich was born in Odessa, but came to live in London when he was eight years old. As a teenager, he studied in Vienna with Leszczycki, who had also taught Paderewski and Artur Schnabel. Moisevich was his last great pupil. very gracious and complimentary and said particularly I thank you for playing my B, B minor prelude. I said it happens to be my favorite one and he said well it's also my favorite one and that created a link of friendship. I said did you have a program when you composed the B minor prelude? He said, yes, his bass voice. I said, good, I won the first round. I said, I know your, your idea is not mine, but I know that mine is correct. He said, all right, you tell me yours, and I'll tell you mine. And we haggled for a while, and eventually. I said, well, mine is a long story. He said, if yours is a long story, it cannot be anything like mine because mine can be answered with one word. So despondently I sat down on the chair and I 
said, well, to me, it suggests the return. Whereupon the long arm shot out. Stop! So I said, why, what have I done? I said, that's what it is. It's the return. It was an exile. And that's what Rahmanov was. <laughs> Perhaps the one pianist since Paderewski who truly captured the imagination of a huge public was Vladimir Horowitz. Horowitz's prodigious technique, his unique bell-like sound, and his personality, which was at once neurotic and yet profoundly musical, led some critics in the 1920s to hail him as the most extraordinary virtuoso they had ever seen. Horowitz was the devil maker, you know, who... who who was really able to, to make the wizardry of, of the piano playing, especially uh, uh, coming to, to this kind of very sparkling, uh, uh, very, how shall I say, really wizardry, uh, uh, where um, when he played, uh, for instance, uh, uh, his own uh, transcriptions or um, uh, Tchaikovsky concerto, uh, the octaves of the Tchaikovsky concerto, nobody could do that like, like him. He was a musician as, as well, but, uh, the, but the, I think the primary concern was for him the, the piano technique, which, which he was the king. When he played at Carnegie Hall in 1920s, and people were standing up to watch his octaves, actually, how does he do it? 
it wasn't so much the speed with which he played these octaves, but that he actually played them faster than he could, probably, and that was the exciting thing. His hands, when he played, that was the most beautiful, real pianist hands. Uh, it was like a beautiful racehorse with many tiny, tiny muscles, and so much uh, reflected the the, the fine uh, uh, technical qualities which uh, he could perform on, on the piano. his showmanship, Horowitz could be nervous of public performance, and once retired from the concert platform completely for 12 years. And that pressure is, is terrific. And for pianists, I think it's a special problem because they have, it's so uh, antisocial, really. I mean, <laughs> they have to sit in a room with this great machine and they have got to, every day, prove that they're the master of it and not the other way around. And uh, that can, I think, because it's a, almost a narcissistic process, complicate the, the psyche. Horowitz was a phenomenon. I think he was extremely shrewd, and I think he was a very smart showman, because he had, um, uh, he knew how to uh, coax his public. In 1965, Horowitz announced that he would end his 12-year retirement and give an afternoon recital at Carnegie Hall. The tickets sold out within hours, though many expected he would ultimately cancel. Everybody who was anybody in the music world had walked in. They saw me standing in the 56th Street entrance of Carnegie Hall, and it was uh, Hurok, the late Saul Hurok, I think, who said to me, what are you going to say when he doesn't show up? How are you going to tell the people this? And I said to him, I don't know. And then about 10 minutes later, Horowitz arrived been caught in his own traffic jam. And here is 2,700 odd people who've been sitting for an hour, waiting. And suddenly, the stage lights go on and the house lights go off. And physically, backstage, it was, the tension was as if one was putting one's hand in an electric socket. And I brought him downstairs, and he got to the edge of the stage and he turned around and faced me just as I'm looking at you and I thought what do I do now and I thought oh okay so I turned him around and put my hand in the lower part of his back 
and pushed him out onto the stage. Well, the wave, the sheer sound wave of all those people getting up and greeting him was physical. It was, you know, ah! You really were just physically hit by it. And he, it got him for a moment. But then, you know, immediately he was straight as a die, standing up, and he went to various sides of the hall to uh, bow to the audience. And then he gestured toward the piano and started to sit down. Well, plunk! The silence was as loud as the applause had been a moment ago. something about perfection and artistry which is contradictory because artistry is not um, a mechanic thing you cannot do something that now you uh, how shall I say you are not a computer and uh, and uh, if you are too much concentrating on on to be accurate then then you lose the essence of art and art is is feeling, to communicate feelings, to feel something and to communicate it. Mostly something about love, you know. Now, how can you feel love if, if you, you feel that you, 
you are a racehorse or you are a, you are you have to be become a computer in a certain way so it's something very contradictory Hungarian gypsy pianist Jörg Schifra had an instinctive musicianship that he first displayed as a five-year-old improvising at the piano for the audience at a Budapest circus. His very individual technique enabled him to play the most demanding works in the piano repertoire with apparent ease. You have a lot of Liszt, since we know you especially as an interpret of Liszt. Yes, when I was here in France, I started with the works of Liszt. Alors, nous avons maintenant fausse légende, si vous voulez, euh, pianiste Sifra qui toujours jouait liste, liste et liste et encore liste. Mais c'est pas vrai, bien entendu. Since he was a gypsy and since he played a lot of liste, everybody said oh, his liste is wonderful. I heard him do a Mozart concerto here in London. Superb, absolutely superb. And I, if I may say that, I really have the feeling that if somebody is really very good in any one, Style, because they are very good in other styles too. We like to classify people that is the romantic, that is the contemporary. But if you play Chopin very well, you play Bach very well too, and Bartok too. Schifra ended his career as a Parisian celebrity, but before he emigrated to France, he was often to be found working as a jazz pianist in a Budapest bar. We enter and I heard the piano playing, a fantastic pianist, and I said, Who is the other pianist? Because I hear that it's a forehand piano pieces they are playing, so there's no other pianist, it's just Chitra. And so I went and I have really seen the most incredible playing which I have ever seen. And um, and so he was improvising on any any tune you gave him as long as you wanted. And um, actually he plays so fast that I could I couldn't know what is he doing. None of us really want danger, and yet we are attracted by it. And the reason why one practices is to, to reduce the possibility of a disaster <laughs> and, and uh, uh, to be as safe as possible. And yet then one realizes that being as safe as possible is often boring. And second thing, you'll never be completely safe because music is something that is alive, and life is never safe. Life is not about this.
1940, as London burned during the Blitz, the British pianist Myra Hess inaugurated a series of recitals in the National Gallery, which turned her into a popular heroine, despite the fact that, somewhat ironically, she specialised in the German classics. and at her best also a very exciting musician because there's that demonic side uh, and the extreme side and the classical veneer is precisely that it's a veneer the, I mean that the core is very hot indeed and someone like Myra Hess could occasionally really zap into it I think the first movement of the Passinata does show the fury and the uh, sense of drama that she had. You know, she takes her chances. It's extremely fast. And there are some technical things which are stunning. There are many, many people who strive for a career as a concert pianist. Uh, the ones that succeed would just would accept the fact that they have fabulous technique and accept the fact that they can really, you know, play the instrument. What it makes people succeed is how they are able to capture the audience.
born in Poland in 1886 and was still giving recitals almost 100 years later. A bon viveur, as much at home in the salon of the rich and famous as on the concert platform, Rubinstein felt part of a lost tradition, as he described it, not of romanticism, but of extreme emotionalism. From the outset of his career, critics commented on the nobility and grandeur of his piano playing, as well as on the range of his repertoire, which stretched from Bach to Albanis and Afaya. But it was his love of performing which made him uniquely popular with his public. Even in his 90th year, he could still declare before a concert that he was the luckiest man I know. I believe very strongly that when we play to an audience, it is not just what they hear, but what emanates from us. That's what makes them come still so much to concerts instead of listening quietly in their slippers to a, to a gramophone performance. Mm -hmm. It makes a big difference, you see, because there is a personal touch, there is an antenna. I sometimes feel in the audience some person, might be anybody, an old man, a young girl, a woman, a man, a, I mean, I, it has nothing to do with, with sex or something like that. But I feel suddenly that there is a person who listens best to me, much better than the others, who takes everything in. And that helps me a lot, because I address myself to that person. There was a certain steadfastness and a certain spine to his music making. I think that had to do with his, with his person, with his personality, something very healthy about his uh, music making. Um, he also had very little patience of, uh, for neurotic, uh, the association between the neurotic and the artistic, which was very common, uh, especially in the first half of the century. In other words, that artistry has uh, something to do with something that is not common, which is true, but also not normal, which is not true. I go to the concert with a feeling of little heart beating. Do I, do I own the piece or not? I mean, what will happen? But this what will happen is all for the good, because that prompts that new approach, that, that same mystery about it as the public feels, you know, and that makes it alive, that makes it alive.
In the early years of the 20th century, the advent of recorded sound and film added a new dimension to the art of the great piano virtuosi. For the first time, it became possible to capture the intimate atmosphere of a salon performance and present it to a wider public. By the 1930s, even the 90-year-old veteran pupil of Liszt, Francis Plante, who had heard Chopin play and won his first piano prize in 1850, had been recorded for posterity on wax and celluloid. These films now serve as a window into a lost age of performance where personality, improvisation and a sense of harmonic structure were at least as important to performers as technical precision. Perhaps the most individual, if also among the most technically unreliable of the early recording artists was the French pianist Alfred Cortot. really captured the spirit of Chopin, which I think is, is um, very, very difficult. This combination of being romantic and expressive and yet aristocratic and restrained, I think he really caught this, this paradox. Corte was a real poet. Everything he did was absolutely, uh, I wouldn't say unexpected, but surprising and profound and colorful and, and imp improvised. His technique was superb too, but in those days, of course, people didn't care so much about notes to the engineers do. So it happens that the recordings which we have of Corto have a lot of wrong notes. 
And I would suggest one should not listen to the wrong notes because he could play the right notes too if he needed to, but he just didn't bother too much. But there were details in any of his performance which were very, very unique. I think Courtois uh, looked for the opium in music, you know. He looked for anything that was extraordinary. He always looked for something, not sickly, but something abnormal, something totally removed from reality and from anything that distinctly could even be construed to be smelling of normality. It me semble que le dernier morceau, le poète parle, c'est là le titre que Schumann a lui-même ajouté à cette page immortelle, devrait être transposé sur un plan de rêverie plus intime, n'est-ce pas Pas seulement la belle sonorité, la détente expressive de la phrase, mais un sentiment plus rêveur. La vérité est qu'il faut rêver ce dernier morceau, pas le jouer. Voulez-vous me permettre de prendre votre place d'interrogation et à nouveau une autre tendrement à interroger l'avenir simplement, non pas dans la musique, mais par un coup du génie dans l'immortalité. qui doivent disparaître, s'éteindre et vous laisser simplement en présence d'un rêve qui se poursuit. All the pianists that we are talking about uh, lived in a tonal world. None of them had <coughs> anything to do with atonal music, with the exception of Glenn Gould. And therefore, the harmony was the leading element, whether the aesthetic was Fischer's, Courtauld, or Rubinstein's. It's not even a question of a conscious decision. This is how the whole training came to being. Which means that when they played arpeggios, for instance, it's not only that they were making a wash of sound, they were actually not playing 16 or 18 notes or whatever the arpeggio may be, but they were playing a flourish of a D-flat major chord or whatever the case may have been. They were looking for something else. They were looking for the, what's between the bar lines, you know, and what, what lay behind all this, and what were these shapes and these gestures what lay behind them, and why, how, how, and first of all, why they made sense, and how you made sense of them, how you built up the vision of order that the composer had had with the implement that you were the master of. 
the inner meaning of music was always of great importance to the German pianist Wilhelm Backhaus, although critics sometimes accused him of a lack of imagination, and Bela Bartok once described him as a performing metronome. His apparent detachment, however, disguised a hidden and unexpected sense of narrative fantasy. mein Lieblingskonzert. Hans Richter nannte dieses Konzert das griechische Konzert. Er deutete den zweiten Satz als das Gespräch von Orpheus, welcher die Gottheit des Hades bittet, Eurydike ihm frei zu geben. Er stößt auf den hartnäckigsten Widerstand, den er durch seine Klage schließlich bezwingen. Öffnet sich das Tor der Unterwelt und sie tanzen hinaus in die griechische herrliche Frühlingslandschaft. Bacchus rather understated everything, but had superb control and technique. So he played and uh, interpreted the music in the most direct, most meaningful way, and tremendous pianism. We see that today we have more technique. Not at all. I know, and with, and with great respect, I admire a lot of the contemporary pianists, but none of them had the technique of a Backhaus, or of Rachmaninoff, or, or Hoffmann, or Levin. Those were techniques which were not just correct and musical and beautiful, and not just very impressive virtues, but so flexible and so colorful that they were able to express any kind of music.
Backhaus was an enthusiastic recording artist, as was another master of the German classics, the innocent, otherworldly Edwin Fischer. Fischer's filmed endorsements of his own recordings are tantalizingly brief, but they are the only visual records that survive of an individual style that combined exquisite refinement with intellect and spontaneity. Beethoven a enseigné à Czerny comment il jouait Le clavecin bien tempéré. Tcherny l'a appelé à Liszt. Liszt l'a appelé à Eugène d'Albert. Eugène d'Albert, qui fut votre professeur, vous a transmis cette tradition. Vous-même l'avez enseigné à toute une génération de jeunes pianistes. Grâce au disque, je peux aussi maintenant me le rappeler à moi-même. The first time I, I heard Edwin Fisher play, I was nine years old, and I will never forget the luminous quality of the sound in very soft playing, whether it was in concert or at the classes that he gave. Fischer had a great distrust, I would say, of anything that was fabricated or manipulated. And there were so many things that were consciously and philosophically left to chance, because he really believed in that, that you cannot and you should not, you can, but you should not calculate a rubato, that if you need the time, well, every day it is different and every day it comes out in a different way. And this is why a lot of his playing has, a, I would say, an, an almost childlike quality, in the best sense of the word. Le toucher d'un pianiste, la douceur d'une voix. was a very great admirer of Edwin Fischer, a very great artist, but also uh, who, who was choosing always artistry and at the moment he was not caring about wrong notes and played wrong notes. Haskell was um, traveling as a young uh, student with uh, another student co colleague in a train. They were discussing pianists and they came to, to Edwin Fischer and um, Haskell said that, well, he's certainly a great artist, but there's so many wrong notes, it's incredible. When they get to the station, they wanted to leave the train, <laughs> who they see on the other side uh, of the compartment, that Edwin Fischer. And Edwin Fischer said, would you please help me with, with this uh, huge, uh, heavy suitcase, very heavy, this suitcase, because it's, you know why? I said, that, no, it's full of my wrong notes, you know, I'm carrying with me. <laughs> So I mean, evidently he overheard the conversation. Shortly after the Second World War, from deep in the heart of Soviet Russia, emerged two pianists whose combination of virtuosity, physical power and intellectual rigor were to startle audiences in the West. <laughs> Jaroslav Richter and Emil Gillels grew up in a culture when great music was still being written for them by composers like Dmitry Shostakovich and Sergei Prokofiev. 
They also evolved as musicians at a time when music was closely identified with the fate of a nation in crisis and at war. definitely had a very special sound of his own. The golden sound, so to say. Every great pianist has a sound of his or her own, an intonation. But some pianists, like for example Horowitz or Gillis, cared for the sound for the sake of the sound. And that's probably what made their sound so special and so personal. Sviatoslav Richter was, like Gilels, a pupil of Heinrich Neuhaus, but Neuhaus later claimed that he had been able to teach Richter nothing. Possessing both exquisite delicacy of touch and a huge range of sonorities, Richter was also an overwhelming physical presence of the keyboard, a combination which awed and sometimes intimidated his colleagues. experimented during the concerts as he did that during practicing so that's why his concerts uh, his concerts were so interesting and so unpredictable 
Я думаю, что там не было -то тогда процесс совместного музицирования. Он был слишком мощен для меня. Я с ним играл два раза. Должен сказать, что оба раза для меня это были очень трудные встречи. Очень трудные. Поскольку от него исходила такая энергия, и энергия, скорее, подавляющего характера, нежели энергии, направленные на коллаборацию, на сотрудничество. some very uneasy or difficult moments uh, of his performances. But when he uh, reached uh, the full concentration, I've never heard more demanding performances from any other pianists. His virtuosity was transcendental. Nevertheless, It was never virtuosity for the sake of virtuosity. Richter's concert repertoire was huge, unlike that of his Italian contemporary Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli, whose reputation was built on infrequent public appearances and a limited performing repertoire. Michelangeli was a maverick, who delighted in creating unusual stories about himself and claimed, among other things, that he was descended from St. Francis of Assisi. But his playing had an absolute technical perfection that compelled the listener and would greatly influence a future generation of pianists. We never hear a single wrong note from Michelangelo. Whereas when we listen to live recordings of even such a great virtuoso as Horowitz was, sometimes we do hear those things.
he didn't really like performing. But then he didn't really like recordings either, and he didn't write books, he didn't give interviews. I mean, it's, it's just as, as though he would almost not exist. He's a ghost, actually. He was very much caring about his looks at the piano, completely obsessed with his movements, how every muscle should work. And yet also you feel this beast somewhere. A beast that he decided to, to, to um, put in a cage and, and make it civilized. Michelangeli shared a taste for the solitary with the Canadian pianist Glenn Gould, who gave up public performance in his early 30s and retired to his lakeside retreat, where he could think, compose and indulge his passion for Bach. He didn't fit uh, at all. Uh, he was a kind of enfant terrible, one of the most influential artists of our time. And this is quite amazing considering that it's primarily because of the way he played Bach and not only the Bach that he plays in a normal way with genius but also the eccentric Bach equally both have influenced us <laughs> live performance was an anachronism and felt uncomfortable with what he saw as the hierarchical division between artist and audience. He looked back fondly to the 18th century when performers and public thought of themselves as equal. I think that, that what happened in the 18th century when performers stopped being composers was the great disaster for music. Uh, and I think that uh, to look at it today as an irrevocable move and to say that this is not any longer correctable 
that we cannot, in fact, get back to that glorious time when performers had a composer's insight into music, and when an audience was cons consisted largely of people who performed and composed for themselves, that we cannot get back to that, I think, is simply to say that music is finished. There are many people around who will tell you that music in our purely Occidental sense is indeed finished. Uh, I don't share that gloom, I must say, but uh, uh, there's good... As a pianist, he called himself either a musician or a composer who expressed himself through the piano. I think what he meant was that when he saw notes on a printed page, he looked on them as a fellow composer. He didn't believe in tradition, and he didn't necessarily believe in playing things a certain way, even, well, particularly, the approved way. And Glenn took this, I think, a little further and played it as he felt, and therefore he was a composer paying his respect to other composers. If Gould saw himself as the first of a new breed of modern pianists, the Chilean Claudio Arau, who died in 1991, was perhaps the last of the great virtuosi who could claim a direct artistic descent from Liszt. Arau's singing line and his combination of textual fidelity with an inspiring imagination dated back to his childhood in Berlin where he was taught by Martin Krauser, one of Liszt's favorite pupils. Arau was a very complex personality. Arau was born in Chile and came to Germany at a very young age and had a fascination with everything that is Teutonic that very often Latin people have because it is exactly the opposite of what they have at home. He devoutly and devotedly 
believed in the seriousness of music. And he therefore was the example of the musician most unwilling to compromise on any level. He played with enormous strength, but he wasn't aggressive. He had, he had paws instead of hands, and he would, as though the piano was actually flexible, he would plunge his hands into it. And he could make a wonderful, rich sound on the piano, very organ-like, not brittle and, and uh, staccato. If you keep your body relaxed, in the, the body is in contact with the depths of your soul. Is that clear? Because it's quite important. Uh, and so, if you, if, are you, if you are stiff in any joint, you impede the, the, the current the emotional, physical current of what the music itself uh, dictates to you. If you have a, jo a stiff joint, you, it, you don't let it go through into the keyboards. все-таки остается главное – доброжелательность с его стороны, легкость контакта с ним и исключительная естественность и логичность замысла. Каждая пауза звучит, нет ни грамма э, поспешности, нет ни грамма ложной виртуозности. Все это отсутствует. И впечатление такое, что перебрасывается в мост 19 век э, к самому Брамсу. I think that the old uh, pianists uh, were able to read the score in the profound sense of the word much better than many piano players of today in the sense that they were not satisfied with just seeing the letter P in piano or where the C of the word crescendo was written. It's basically the relativity, piano in relation to what, to what comes before and what comes afterwards. Well, all this is not in this core. And all that area, which is actually the area of music making, was a totally natural phenomenon for all these pianists, regardless of where they came from and what school they came from. The Bible for them was the sound and not the printed page. Vanity, vanity is the most terrible, the most blocking things for, for an interpreter. If you are sure that what you have to say is unique, then you are not, not out to please or not to please. Or, or, or to impress or not to impress. You have your message and that's it. If they like it, it's all right. If they don't, I don't know whether it's clear. <laughs> 